Afternoon, uh, everyone. First of all, my apologies for being a couple minutes late there. Uh, a few technical uh, glitches on my end. Um, my name's Tom Gonzales. I'm uh, Manitoba Agriculture's Vegetable Crop Specialist. Uh, welcoming you to the second of uh, five webinars in this year's uh, 2021 Horticulture School March webinar series. Today's topic is sweet corn production part two. Uh, coming up next Wednesday, uh, the 17th is a webinar on passive solar greenhouses. On the 24th is hydroponic vegetable production. And on the 31st is pumpkin and squash production. So hopefully you uh, will uh, be attending those as well. Uh, speakers today include John Hurd, John Gavlosky, Vikram Bisht, and Kim Brown, and myself from Manitoba Agriculture. Uh, we're still going to be trying the question and answer format uh, today. I'm hoping uh, those of you who have questions are willing to uh, type them in the chat and uh, make it uh, interactive for us and try to give us some good questions. If, uh, if you do, that'd be great. So I guess uh, let's basically get started here. Uh, I think I've gone through most of this. I'm just kind of going fast because I think I mentioned it up to here so today's uh, discussion we're going to go through sweet corn soil and nutrient management uh control of uh corn borers uh control of what we're going to call in brackets varmints of all descriptions uh we're going to talk a little bit about uh, sweet corn growth harvest marketing and throw in some economics on there so that is where I'd like to leave this. And I'm going to ask John to get ready to rock and roll. And actually, uh, when it comes to John's area of expertise, uh, the one thing I'd, I'd like to start with basically is uh what types of soils do we uh think are best for producing sweet corn okay th th thanks tom and, and we did talk a bit about this the other week but since i'm going to get into fertility and stuff i thought i'd just go over uh these first you can grow sweet corn on many types of soils but there's a few pointers i want to point out that if you're trying to hit the early market the sandy, well-drained soils will warm up the quickest. So they're gonna to get to that critical temperatures Tom talked about uh, between 10 to 15 degrees C and they'll merge. So sandy, well-drained soils, good for that. The downside is, and, and where I am here, it's the Al Mississippi soils, they, sandy soils don't hold much moisture. And uh, uh, we probably, uh, where I look at where field corn, we don't grow sweet corn as long, but probably sweet corn is looking for 15 inches, 15 to 20 inches of water use during the year. Uh, sandy soils, they store maybe two and a half to five inches in the soil in the rooting zone, whereas clay or clay loam soils will store uh, four to two to four times that much. So if you do have those clay loam soils, those ones are going to hold you uh, uh, through the dry part of the year better. Uh, bottom line is, you you're probably you're stuck with what you've got. So you improve what you have. So you drain wet soils, you know, either with surface drainage or uh, tile drainage. In fact, my dad was bugging me. I should have tiled my patch <laughs> long ago because I've lost way too many crops due wow. to wet sandy soils uh, that just fill up with water. The other thing is sandy soil is very susceptible to erosion, wind erosion in this area. Uh, and so it, that's an important consideration. And an absolute must is you just do not grow sweet corn on salty soils. Uh, the uh, plant, uh, just like soybeans or field corn, is not able to tolerate uh, if we have uh, much salinity. So, and that kind of leads into the soil test, but then why do people soil test? Well, it's because they think 
that they need that to figure out how much fertilizer they need. But but basically, it it helps also to uh, highlight some of the other yield limiting factors, uh, such as salinity. One of the things that uh, uh, I had down here before you we, we take a soil test, but the fertilizer or manure rates you need will also depend on your yield goal. If you've got previous crops, uh, it's great if you can follow a legume crop. Uh, or a cover crop that's a legume that has made nitrogen. Uh, manure is really important. If you can access that, if you have that, uh, that can meet a full array of nutrients, not necessarily in a balanced amount. Uh, and, and that is one of the problems with small vegetable holdings is we do tend to over fertilize. We tend to over manure, we tend to over fertilize. That won't get you in trouble with corn would get you in trouble with things like potatoes and yeah, tomatoes. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so cor corn better able to tolerate over fertilization than some other crops. So I just wanna go over some strategies for uh, uh, getting your fertilizer or your fertility plan in place. Uh, first is, uh, you know, we recommend soil testing and it's the same type of soil testing as what you do for field crops. Uh, uh, we like, a uh, uh, a two sample test, one uh, zero to six inches for your nutrients that aren't mobile. So your phosphorus, potassium, and your micronutrients. And then we like a second uh, sample for your, your six to 24 inch depth. And that's what we measure uh, nitrogen and sulfur on. So uh, you may have this commercially done, or you may just drop into one of the remaining ag offices that's still open and borrow some of their museum pieces and you can sample yourself. Uh, and get a sir back. Too. Yeah, yeah. And there's, there's, there's about three main commercial labs that do this. I just happen to have a picture of AgVise, uh, Farmer's Edge, located in Winnipeg. They do this. And uh, there's a lab based out of London, Ontario, ANL Canada, that also uh, analyzes Manitoba samples. Or as I mentioned, AgVise, they're located in North Dakota, and they've got a couple uh, pickup sites in Manitoba and uh, Portage and Winkler. So you get a soil test back, something like this. Here's one from one of my fields at home one year. And I just want to point out something that I've recently become aware of. I put down here under the yield goal seven tons per acre. And that's kind of before Tom. I tuned in and figured out, well, what's a typical yield? Right. Well, a more typical yield is maybe a thousand dozen per acre. That'd be yeah. great. That, 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 that's a target. Yeah. That would be a great target. Well, that, according to uh, uh, some literature look at, that's only four tons the acre. Okay. So that's a fairly modest uh, yield. And, uh, and there, there, there's several reasons for that. Some of these higher yields would be for commercial uh, canning. You know, AgVise, they uh, also do uh, uh, offer this service down in Minnesota. And Minnesota and Wisconsin produce most of uh, the American canned corn. So those are commercial type yields, not uh, uh, farmer's market or hand-picked yields. Right. So changing that yield can change your recommendations quite a bit. Uh, so, you may choose something, your yields may be higher than that, but ju just be aware that uh, uh, don't be overly optimistic. The Manitoba agricultural recommendations, I typed in here on the side. We do have some guidelines and I'll, I'll come to them uh, next year. But I just wanted to point out a couple other things on here, the soil test. Here's the soluble salts. That, let me get the marker going here. Oh, that's the salinity numbers. So this is nice. I'm on a, a, a Al Mississippi sandy soil that tends to drain fairly well. So I don't get a buildup of salts in it. Uh, uh, my pH is reasonable uh, when my pH is there. Uh, it's a little acreage uh, that I have that was highly manured in the past. And that's showing up here by that very high phosphorus number that uh, normally people wouldn't fertilize to that level, but inadvertently people can manure to that level. And, and this potassium level is pretty good for 
a sandy soil. Uh, the other big thing to look at is nitrogen. So that's, that's an example soil test with most of the important things. Uh, here's a, another test here. This one here, the nitrogen number in the soil came back quite a bit higher and reduced the amount. Uh, the only other nutrient that is important really is uh, zinc. I'll show some pictures of zinc deficiency later and may, maybe sulfur. Uh, so we're looking at nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, and zinc. Those are probably the ones that uh, uh, would affect uh, corn most of all. Um, here I went through and picked through uh, our historical document, Tom. Uh, uh, Manitoba Agriculture used to run a soil test lab until 1992, and these recommendations are still on the books. They're, they're just well hidden because we haven't published a book recently. But if I look at, you know, what are the guidelines based on soil test levels? Uh, we, we do have uh, values for nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and sulfur. One of the things that's really pertinent with phosphorus and for potassium, note the difference between broadcast rates and banded. Quite often in vegetable crops, we broadcast our fertilizer. It's a uh, simple and quick way to do that, but the rates tend to be very high. And that's because most vegetable crops have a poor rooting system. And so we make up for a poor root uh, exploration of the soil by supplying surplus fertilizer. Where if we can ban the fertilizer, which is the phosphorus here or the potassium over here, fertilizer is banded, it, it has quite a bit better access to the plant and we can reduce the rates. In phosphorus, we can reduce the rates uh, almost five times if we precision place close to the plant. Uh, with potassium, we say we can reduce those rates in half. So, uh, and I'll show some pictures of that. Yeah, yeah. And really, uh, as I say, oh, one of our real concerns with uh, vegetable production is this tendency to over fertilize. And uh, a few years ago, Tom, we, uh, uh, Mayo Tenuta at the university, right did a comparison, uh, sent out students, they, they, they got soil samples from uh, vegetable growers uh, who were commercial farmers and those that were gardeners. And the commercial farmer range rates were all in generally that medium high range, but the vegetable gardens that people had in Winnipeg, Elm Creek or St. Claude, actually many of those, particularly in phosphorus, we're well into the red zone, we're uh, uh, excessively fertilized. So that's one, one, one of the concerns we have if, if you are loading too much nutrients into your, into your patch. Um, the ways to apply, uh, one is uh, here, here's a, a corn planter and you can see there are some uh, extra tanks on that. Those tanks are applying a uh, fertilizer uh, generally, we can put on some seed placed, but many are set up to put it two inches beside and two inches below the roll. We call that a sideband placement. And that's where we pick up the efficiency in phosphorus and potassium versus broadcasting. You know, there's a number of broadcast fertilizer units. Mine at home is an old three point hitch spin spreader, but nevertheless, it, it places the fertilizer, mixes it well, it's uh, quick, easy, and one thing, it means we're not getting fertilizer too close to the seed. And that's, that, that's critical for particularly some vegetables. So that, that's, uh, that's the main ways by which fertilizer would be put down. And of course, if manure is being applied, it would be applied and then it would be uh, worked in, uh, dist or, yeah. or, or cultivated in. Um, this going on here. One of the other questions we sometimes get is, uh, can I do reduced tillage? Uh, Tom, you, you had a, uh, a person send in a question last week about cover crops, so right. I can mention a bit. But where I am on my Mississippi sandy soils, 
they can blow terrible. Uh, of course, it's always the neighbor's stuff that's blowing, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> but that sand, it, it, it can really beat up. This is last year's pictures of the field just a mile from my place where uh, uh, my neighbor did not have cover on here. And within a day after the sandstorm, the plants almost looked dead. Here's a picture a week later. Yes, there's new growth that's formed. So uh, the plants were not killed. And then within uh, two, three weeks, I'm back. The only sign of that injury are those bottom leaves. But I have lost maybe a week's growth as, nice. as that plant sits still. So um, uh, nice to have sandy soils to get a quick start, but it's vulnerable to this erosion. Now, I, I got to mention that the neighbor directly behind me, grew potatoes, established rye in the fall, and instead of having this taking place, he, he planted into that rye, sprayed it out later, and had a perfect stand. A real, a real testament to how well that type of a cover crop can work. Um, but uh, so, so when it comes to cover crops uh, uh, or reduced tillage, I say that uh, yes, those are a, a good way to go as long as it doesn't compromise your early seeding because the soils will stay colder. They'll be slower to warm up under a lot of crop residue or cover crops. And uh, so my suggestion is, and, and what I, I, I do is I say, well, uh, uh, you may till for your first planting to get your warm soils, but for mid to late season plantings, where there's generally lots of, of good soil temperatures, that's where we've got an opportunity to go into crop residue. And not only do we control erosion, but we've preserved water. Uh, so I, I got a picture of that. Now, here's the very person. Uh, <laughs> uh, obvious, obviously, this person has a, has a government job to supplement their, <laughs> their, their, their experiments with. But this is zero tilled sweet corn into a uh, previous wheat crop. And yes, there are issues with that. There's hair pinning. Here, here's my uh, 1960s dial planter. So there's nothing special on it. It just is a disc seeder that seeds in, does a pretty good job of making a slot, but I can get hair pinning of residue in there. Uh, one thing to note on here, uh, here's the fertilizer hoppers uh, that I'll put the fertilizer down with. They only seed three rows at a time. This row is for the wheelbarrow top. Yes. Yeah. Or yeah, the for, yeah. Or and for driving. Yeah. But uh, uh, I want to show that. And, and Kim Brown's with me now. <laughs> and Kim's looking at that and saying, "Oh, you're just setting yourself up for weeds <laughs> with that." And, and yes, I did have to use some aggressive, you know, some control early to to take the winter annual weeds out in the quack grass. You mentioned that last week, the importance of that. And then I'm dependent on weed control chemicals for a while, but I always come in with iron. Right. So I would come in after this uh, at least twice with my uh, uh, cultivator, steel cultivator, yep. and 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 get a do an adequate job. Last last year, I got to brag about this. Had my neighbor come in with his corn planter, ran over. He has trash whippers on his plant, so he wasn't seeding. All he was doing was doing my tillage, and you can see the wonderful black strip he worked up. This is like uh, the strip till system that's used in row crop, and you can see the, those lovely bare strips, but uh, basically undisturbed in between. And later, once that crop was established, you can see it coming up. Uh, here in that bare strip, I had much better emergence. That soil is warm, and uh, uh, so I, 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 I'm, I'm hooked on this. If, if the neighbor will keep humoring me and keep doing this, uh, uh, but I think it's a neat way to incorporate conservation tillage with something like sweet corn. Again, dependent on some chemical weed control to hold the weeds early. This still allowed me to come back with, with cultivation, so uh, I I still did have that option. I'd prefer not to have to cultivate, but I I just don't want to have to 
put that much uh, spray in that crop for weed control or not good enough to control it yeah. with herbicides. Uh, okay, uh, Tom, see if th there's any questions on the tillage or let's see here. If anyone uh, has any questions, I probably uh, didn't go over it enough, but your best way to to ask a question is to uh, insert it in the uh, question and answer uh, portion here. And uh, here we got one. Can calcium and potassium be used together in the fertilizer for sweet corn? Yeah, yes, uh, uh, absolutely. And uh, uh, I'm going to go back and show that uh, uh, potassium, uh, in this case, there were some recommendations for potassium, and, and potassium. Uh, can be applied in that uh, side by side. Well, it can't be placed with the seed because potassium is harsh on the seed. Uh, and we say our guideline is we can put up to 300 pounds of fertilizer in that two by two band. Potassium can also be broadcast, but again, needs to be at a higher rate to account for the poor efficiency. Calcium, well, looky here, Mother Nature gives me. 2,482 parts per million. So that's like 4,800 pounds per acre. Uh, the good news is you should never have to spend a lick of calcium on our fields in Manitoba. Uh, our soils are derived from glacial till, and a lot of those glaciers rode over the interlake, which is made of limestone, dolomitic limestone, calcium and magnesium. So, don't be distracted by calcium. The only case where you may need to apply calcium is if your soil pH is down into uh, below six, 5.5 or so, then it's acidic. And if we have acidic soils, our recommendation would be to apply some limestone, which is calcium carbonate. And that would meet your needs. Uh, but, uh, uh, there's no need for calcium. In other garden crops, sometimes you supply calcium because even when we have this large amount of soil, if we get droughty conditions during the year for things like uh, tomatoes, like peppers, yes. we don't get enough transpiration flow in, in, uh, and, and, and movement of calcium through the soil water to the plant into those parts of the fruit and so we can get a uh, blossom end rot. You could do two things. You can then supply some calcium foliar or you can simply water your tomatoes, Tom. Water them consistently. Yeah. That's the key. Yes. You keep the darn things watered and yeah. then you don't need to put on the, the calcium. Absolutely. So, uh, good. Anyways, that, that's our take on that. Uh, but it, it did trigger, there was one, one other question before I went on. Uh, I didn't mention about cover crops or maybe i do i think i do in another next slide so i'll i'll mention it there okay oh well why don't i i go right to it I'm sure gonna... yeah well maybe it isn't even in here so let me i'll i'll, I'll mention i went to write it down uh the question came in uh from one of the the viewers last week about cover crops uh i I'm I'm really hip on cover crops after sweet corn. Right. Uh, uh, something I learned from my dad, and I continue to do, and the soil test recommends it. Nitrogen makes sweet corn. And remember, we only grow this crop partway through its lifetime. We're done with it in mid-August, and and uh, then if you're going to destroy that crop or something, that can leave a lot of nitrogen in the stock that's vulnerable to losses. And so. What could be a good strategy is to, if you're going to destroy that uh, uh, sweet corn residue, is to follow with a rye cover crop. Uh, rye will pick up that nitrogen and hold it in a form it, and, and help carry it over to next year, in addition to providing erosion control, particularly on sandy soils. Uh, that's what we used to do at home. And that's what some may choose to do here. If that's your crop residue, uh, a system. Uh, so, uh, and rye would be 
uh, uh, the most aggressive crop to, to hold that nitrogen and to get established. Uh, now, what I do, I'm, I'm too lazy to do that, and I have cattle. So I simply fence my cattle into my sweet corn. And I think the question, Tom, came from something with goats. Yes, there was. And, when, and I said, absolutely. Uh, uh, it's, it's a great way. They will take out, uh, uh, the, uh, if they've got some cows, the cows will teach the heifers how to pull off the, the cobs that, that I didn't get. And uh, uh, so the, they'll eat the cobs, they'll, they'll eat leaves. And uh, uh, if their stocking rate's high enough, you'll just, just be left with sticks in the field. Uh, I, I leave it till winter, it holds snow for me, and it's pretty easy to uh, just cover up in the spring. As you mentioned, Tom, you can run a mower over. Yeah. I, I have what you suggested, just a, a three-point hitch, a rotary mower. Single blade. Single blade, yeah. It, yeah. it'll chew up what's left. And then one disking after that, and I pretty well got a seed bed for whatever's following. Right. Uh, I'd be curious though if there's others online, if you have some alternate methods. Uh, uh, for some vegetable crops, you may find that uh, um, those corn stalks slow to rot down and uh, a bit of a nuisance. Uh, but they can be for sure. Yeah. So, but it, it may cause you to do more tillage than. Normal uh, for me, I, I, I let some cattle look after that. Uh, it just means putting up electric fence around the corn patch uh, in uh, in September. Right. When you were when you were mentioning about the goats, I did get a reply from a uh, person uh, more familiar with goats specifically than I am, and talked about uh, there could be issues if goats. Or how's it worded here? Uh, stocks could be high in nitrates due to frost damage in the fall, and may produce toxins for goats. So yeah, uh, interesting point. Uh, we're gonna get to some physiology in the corn plant, but the one thing is uh, the corn plant takes up nitrogen from the soil and tends to store it in the stalk, and the uh, the bottom foot of the corn stalk tends to be high in nitrates. So that would be one thing you'd want to do. You don't want to stock high enough population uh, that they grub everything off. Right. In fact, some dairy farmers uh, in concern for this high nitrates, when they're harvesting corn silage in the fall, actually will raise the, the, the cutter bar to leave the high nitrate portion in the field. So uh, I'm glad you mentioned that. That's something that uh, you wouldn't want to uh, uh, graze completely to the ground. That that might be an issue. The other thing was um, uh, if someone had use for it, they could they could silage this off yeah. too. They could take for this sure. off as corn silage. Yeah. Uh, uh, the the feed value may not be that high because the cob's mm -hmm. missing, but. Uh, uh, it's probably fine for beef cows. It depends how good your pickers are. You pay to go in there. Yeah. Yeah, how selective they are. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, so that's. I don't know if you want me to continue, or well, if you wanted to click, kick over to, I, to I, John and. I think maybe if we just switch gears a sure. little bit mm -hmm. to go into uh, corn borer uh, control, just quickly look for any other questions. If while we're going on, if anyone has any. Uh, any questions, feel free to uh, to uh, put them uh, put them uh, in the question and answer here. I'm just going to switch over and uh, here get ready. And for for John here, John's going to talk to us a little bit about control of European corn borer and. Uh, our our big insect problem that we and everybody else seems to have. So, what do you think, John? Sure. So first of all, I'm gonna just. Oops. Oh, oh we don't have. I'm missing a slide here, but I will. Um, just go to a picture of Cornbo at the beginning. My apologies. I'm flipping around here a little bit. Um, there we go. So this picture here, which is actually. Um, my slide on BT corn shows a picture of a European corn borer. And what I do want to point out here 
um, there's more than one caterpillar that can be in your corn. There's European corn borer, that's uh, a common one here. Um, note it's kind of a white, some people will say a pinkish white color with spots. The other thing we can get in our corn is another caterpillar called the corn earworm. And corn earworm, instead of being um, white with spots, is either yellow or greenish with stripes. So just again, make sure you know what caterpillar it is you're dealing with. And now I'm gonna flip forward a few slides here and get on to insecticides for European corn borer. So first of all, um, what you can do to decide, uh, do I need to spray and when would be a good time to start? There are pheromone beta traps you can put up. Uh, there's lures you can buy for corn borer and corn earworm. Um, in Manitoba, we mainly have been using a trap called the Delta Trap. It's shaped like a, uh, like a D-shaped almost. They call it a Delta Trap. They're uh, either a, a sturdy plastic or a cardboard trap. They have a sticky liner in them. You put the lure in, it draws in either corn earworm or corn borer. And once you know that they're flying in the area, we suggest you go into the field, start looking for egg masses, young larvae. If you do need to spray, um, you've got options. And I've John, I've got a question. Sure. What would I do uh, about that time when I've got uh, so or before soaking? Anyways, I go out at nights with a flashlight at dusk and walk the rows and look for the little white moss flying around. That doesn't give me a good indication of the numbers, but just kind of the incidents that they're in the area then, is it? Well, as long as you know that it's corn borer you're seeing. The tricky part is uh, a walking along the edge of a cornfield in early July, there's likely going to be a lot of activity. Uh, corn borer being one of the potential moths. Okay. There's uh, other moths um, in the same family or group uh, that it can look somewhat similar. Um, so yeah, just, and of course, light at night to a moth will draw in. Well, it's okay, I still uh, gotta chase them because I, I, I gotta catch them so I can bring them in. To and, get them out. I can find them by finding the snout on the... Well, on the yeah, corn borer belongs to a group that, uh, um, they almost look, look like they've got a, a snout on them, which separates them from some of the other moths that you might okay. find. But yeah, if you you turn on a light at night, you're gonna get moths, uh, probably more than just corn borer. So just make sure you know what you've got. And again, know that it's, it is corn borer that you're, you're seeing, but you are right. Um, now corn borer during the day, they do tend to like to move almost out of the corn into where there's denser vegetation. Some of that um, roadside vegetation where it's denser and that's well, often- So you should be driving in the ditch. With you, you, you could drive in the ditch if you want to. Uh, I'm not gonna uh, uh, suggest that for everybody, but John, you can. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, that, that's a good place to be looking for the, the adults anyway, is that interface between your, your ditch area and the corn. They can move in quite a ways, but that's often where they're hanging out during the day. Now, well, as far as products go, I've got two pages of insecticides uh, that I'll show because there are quite a few things registered. And I've actually broken it down so that on page one here, we have our organic options, a group that I call selective. Selective means it kills caterpillars and nothing else. And then another group called semi-selective. So these are things in this group that kill any caterpillar and they will kill some other groups of insects, but they won't kill bees and some of your beneficials. So I'll, I'll go over some of them. Now in the organic group, you've really got two options. There's something called Entrust. Entrust, it's, uh, it's based on, well, it is a, a fungal derived insecticide. So that's what makes it organic. Um, there's a, a uh, a synthetic version of this called Success, that's in it with our semi-selective products. They're really the same chemistry. Success is the synthetic version. You can't use that in organic systems. 
in trust is the fully organic version. So you'll probably pay a bit more for the in trust than you will for yes, the success. Yeah. But if you're doing it organically, uh, again, these are your two options. If you do decide to try using Dipel or Bioprotec, uh, keep in mind that these only work on caterpillars and they only work, they work best on young caterpillars. So with this one, you would have to time it very well so that uh, you're getting the product on pretty much right after egg hatch for it to work effectively. Um, the positive side to this product is it's got a zero day pre-harvest interval. So theoretically, you could be putting it on uh, the day before you're picking. Um, and trust it's a seven day. And do keep an eye on the pre-harvest intervals. Uh, once you start getting close to when you're picking, that's an important consideration. But you'll notice that pretty much all of the um, organic, semi-selective and selective products, it's a week or less. So luckily these are um, pretty short. My one selective product, Intrepid, newer product, it kills only Lepidoptera, so caterpillars basically. Uh, so if you're trying to protect pollinators or uh, beneficial insects, it's a good option. I'm not sure about availability. There is some in Manitoba uh, targeted for the heart market. Um, again, a newer product. As far as semi-selective, few options. Um, the top two here belong to a group called the Diamides, Corrigin and Viego. Um, what's good about these products is they have very long residuals. So um, you put them on and you should be good. John, have you used Corrigin in the past? I, I have, and that was one of the attractions to it, but the selectivity, as you say, it's good on the others, but I can go maybe uh, up to 10 days to two weeks yeah. before a respray. Now, I'm just following the label, but that's what they say, versus uh, you know some of the traditional, I, it seemed I was in there every week. Yes. Before. Corrigin and products like it in the same family, I mean, they're becoming quite popular with growers. I, I haven't done a survey, but I would venture to say you'd be looking at half probably of producers that I know of would have core would use courage. Yeah, and and th that's the advantage of it uh, is that the residual you don't have to be applying as much. You will pay more for this than you will say a pyrethroid. If you want to put on ambush or desis or something, you can put it on for uh, probably less than half the cost, but you are applying more frequently, so that adds up too. So that brings us to our broad spectrum products. Um, I've broken it into three different groups here, and these are just based on chemistries. Uh, this first group here, these are all what we call pyrethroids. So Matador, Desis, um, Ambush, Mako, these are some of the products you might recognize. Um, all the same basic chemical structure, um, tend to be very economical, but as mentioned, they won't have the residual of something like a Corrigin or Viego. Volume Express, it's a mixture between um, essentially Corrigin and Matador, uh, half rate of each. So uh, that can be an option, but in this case, I don't, being a half rate, whether you get the full advantage, it's hard to know. And the final group here is your organophosphates, malathion and orthene. Um, so they're kind of in between as far as maybe residual goes, probably similar to the pyrethroids as far as residual goes with these products. So John, usually it's 30 degrees when I'm spraying, <laughs> and you've coached me in the past, the pyrethroids, why is it that I may avoid those? Yeah, th that's a very good question. Um, some insecticides are temperature sensitive, meaning they just don't work as well at certain temperatures. And the pyrethroid group in general, once you get into the, even the high 20s, we suggest do not spray these when it's, some of the, the, the labels will say 25, some of them say 27 on them, but really once you get into the high 20s, much above 25, do not be using the pyrethroids. Uh, if you are gonna apply them, wait till it's cooler before you apply them, but don't be out um, in the heat of the day using something like Desis or Matador. It's you, just a waste. You won't get the same control. Yeah. That's bottom line. Okay, um, thanks, John. I'm just gonna have a little look here, see if I can find any additional questions. I encourage anyone 
that has any questions to type them into the uh, the cool. question and answer there. I, I got a question that I told John would get to later when we talk about bird control, but John, t t tell us about, uh, are any of these going to attract in birds or things like this? That's a good question. There was actually a study done in Ontario where they found that uh, damage by red-winged blackbirds was a lot more in fields that had more corn borer. So, the uh, short answer is yes. If you have a lot of, of mm -hmm. caterpillars in the cobs, the birds know that. They, they can sense that there's caterpillars there and they will peck away at the cobs. Um, mm -hmm. Not that they, blackbirds will eat the kernels, but they actually even prefer caterpillars over kernels. Okay. So if you have a lot of corn borers or corn earworm in those cobs, uh, yeah, you can anticipate maybe some enhanced. More entry then. Okay. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, thanks, John. Now I'm just. Uh, oh, John. Yeah. Do, do do I gotta burn and bury my corn stalks in the fall? Remember that old law. In, it used to be in the states that you had to have your corn stalks buried to stop the corn borer. Is that a relevant recommendation still? Well, there, there used to be a corn borer act at one time, <laughs> even. So they actually it was a legislative pest in the U.S. for a while. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, corn corn borer overwinters as a pupa inside corn stalks. Now um, you don't have to mm -hmm. burn. We, we, you talked earlier about mowing, and our chefsman in Ontario, he actually did a study where they um, they uh, cut the stubble at different heights, mm -hmm. and they found when, when they mowed very low, they actually got very good control of corn borers. They will go quite low in the stock to overwinter. Mm -hmm. And we've noticed that too when we do our surveying in the fall. Uh, if, if a lot of them go right down almost to ground level to do their overwintering. Um, I've even seen them in the stocks below the ground. So yeah, if you're trying to deal with the trash in a way that's going to get you corn borer control, the lower you can go, the better. So if you okay. can mow it almost straight down, you'll... Okay, Tom, you guys muted yourself. There we go. How far how far back were we muted on? Do we know? Oh, about a minute and a half. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, Everything that John heard said uh, was okay, but John uh, Gablowski was muted. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, we, we were talking about mowing height and corn borer control. And the gist of it is, the lower that you can mow your corn, the better corn borer control you will get. Corn borers do move down pretty low in the stalks. I mean, they they overwinter at different heights, but a lot will move quite low in the stalks to overwinter. So the lower you can get your mowing or or trash, uh, the, the better corn borer control you can get. So. Some people might prefer higher stubble for whatever reason, snow trapment or whatever, but if it's corn borer control you're after, the lower is better. Okay, uh, John Gblowski, I have a question. Do you uh, think that uh, crop rotation will help in uh, managing the problem? Um, crop rotation is a good thing to do for many reasons, but corn borer, it's, I'll, I'll say maybe of moderate help, but corn borer is a decent flyer, and there's enough corn in the landscape. Uh, even if you've rotated your crop, you still have a decent risk of having corn borer. It, it, rotation is a good thing to do. It could help because they are overwintering in last year's corn stalks. Uh, but again, they are a good flyer, so it's not like with corn rootworm or some other insects where you can be guaranteed control. Right. You still need to be scouting even if you've rotated your corn. Um, and also corn borer has many hosts, not just corn. Uh, you will find corn borer in millet, hemp, quinoa, wheat, uh, lots of plants. So uh, even if you didn't have corn right next to your this year's corn patch, last year I was in a millet field 
just loaded with corn borer. So, um, yeah. Don't uh, forget potatoes. potatoes. Yes, potatoes, definitely. Another host. Glad, glad you had that question, Vikram, because I'm getting tired of asking them. But I got another one, John. Um, a lot of my neighbors grow corn, but they are growing BT field corn. And I'm just wondering, do we have so much BT field corn around that that's what's keeping the corn borer levels down? It, is, is that, like, can I skip a year now because their control is so good in the field corn? Well, with some of the field corn growers are doing just that. They're actually skipping a year growing BT because they've noticed that the levels are down. And they certainly are because when we're doing our fall surveys looking for corn borer, uh, I have to get more creative to find mm -hmm. the populations that I used to. Uh, as I mentioned, um, millet seems to be highly attractive, I think because of the staging. I managed to find a field last year, it was just loaded. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, there is a lot of BT corn being grown. Well over half of the grain corn acres are BT in most years. Um, so that does help lower the population somewhat. Yeah. Um, there are BT, uh, Tom mentioned it last week, there are BT sweet corn varieties, but I don't think that people grow them because no. the consumer acceptance just isn't there. But for grain corn, it is extremely common. Um, a lot of the growers grow it and it does keep the levels lower. Okay. Now, most of those growers nowadays are using what they call an integrated refuge, uh, meaning they put refuge in the bag, the refuge variety is already blended in so they don't have the 20% around the field. If by chance you are a sweet corn grower and you decide you do want to try to grow BT corn, um, there is no refuge that you have to plant, but you have to make sure that you totally clean that field up of um, your stocks afterwards. Right. That's the rule. Okay. Um, just gonna look for more questions before we move on. Ah, there's a tomato question about uh, blossom end rot. We basically talked about that a little bit earlier in the sense of uh, even watering, consistent uh, supply of moisture to the uh, to the plant will uh, will basically uh, reduce or eliminate problems with. Uh, with blossom end rot, it's it is technically a calcium problem, but it's exacerbated by the the in fluctuation of water supply. It's not necessarily way too dry. It's dry, wet, dry, wet kind of thing that makes it worse. Um, the way I explain it, Tom, is that uh, there's there's lots of calcium there. It just needs the free ride, and so it floats with the water. And if your water supply is intermittent or shut off you're not getting that constant supply of calcium so right. it's not a calcium problem it's as you say a, a water supply consistency for sure now let's switch gears a little bit and think in terms of varmints varmints has a huge connotation to it um i'm old enough to remember beverly hillbillies as a kid and uh Jed Jethro Ali May always talked about varmints. Now, John, what do you think varmints are? Well, one I don't have on my list is possums. Oh, there you but, go. Uh, but, but, but possums are big in yeah. southern Ontario now, and, and, and they're an issue down there. But what I had uh, just on my list here to make some comments on, uh, we talked a bit about the blackbirds and, and their problems, and, and that's why, John, I, 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 I put this question to you about uh, keep the bugs under control. That should maybe be up near the, the, the start of, of patrolling blackbirds as possible. But th there's a number of things out there and there's something new I just found on Google. Anyways, so if, you, if you're doing this stuff, uh, the big thing that the publications seem to say is you gotta start scaring the birds before they find your corn is ready. So if they found the corn, uh, you have a very poor chance of keeping them out. And uh, there's some of the universities down east have done a lot of testing. Uh, Cornell has tested these. Uh, there's the scare balloons. Those are those big balloons with the eyes on them. I think you gotta keep moving them around. 
uh, so they don't get used to because they make wonderful things to perch on too once they're not scared anymore uh, so if you use those owls and the other thing that I haven't seen in the field yet but those air dancers now those are those things that you see at the used car dealers yeah. that uh, uh, those two men yeah. that, that flop up and down apparently they could be effective uh, the noisemakers or bangers and I find those work best if they're interspersed with some real gunfire. <laughs> <laughs> kind of keeps them on their toes. And that the other one that I had here was chemicals and a question mark, because I just don't think these chemicals are registered here, but I'm if, not aware of it. You no, know, if you go to the old books, you'll see that Avatrol was some type of a, a, an agent that that, that scared them or, or made birds in distress. And when they would fly around in distress, they would scare the other birds. I don't know about that, but what is really neat here, popped up in, in the fact sheet from Rhode Island, they've been working on lasers. And, and so I was thinking, oh man, we're knocking birds out of the air with lasers. <laughs> but uh, uh, anyways, what, what it is, they uh, use, uh, they call them laser scarecrows. So if you, you Google up that, they found them very effective. And I think it's just these, these lights uh, that the lasers create shooting around uh, works fairly well. They actually say that uh, uh, they, they're not for sale. They're not making them, but they have plans for making them from the University of Rhode Island. And uh, that they have found that those have become uh, uh, a, a nice benign way of doing that. So I don't know a thing about that, Tom. I think you should try it out. Well, it, it might be worth trying, yes, uh, but I am I have no familiarity with it. I can't think of comment. Okay, well, I'm gonna text this to you or something. There you go, thank so, you. But what, what Tom was really interested in, what do we do with the coons and the skunks and the deer? Yes. And uh, 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 there's just some good ideas here. And you're gonna work for me here. Because when we get to the last question, you're going to send me your answers. But uh, things that uh, could be done, maybe better for deer than others, is electric fencing. Uh, uh, if you're talking raccoons or skunks, you've got to be pretty close to the ground. Good farm dogs. I just had a bad one. It's gone now, but we'll be replacing it with a, a loud, bigger dog. Uh, anything as far as hook to motion detectors like lights or have noise or radios this might work for smaller patches i have the location of the field i am fortunate i am somewhat landlocked but a lot of my uh, colleagues that are growing sweet corn are along creeks and if you have a creek you have an unlimited supply of raccoons and i know talking to one of my neighbors they, they, they trap 22 to 23 coons a year and they still are not on top of them so uh location of your field is going to affect how many you have uh the other one i put in here just plant extra for the critters uh but nobody really likes to do that and then there are uh the live traps and um uh, i i have a couple I, i've got one right now lent out to a friend who's got a skunk problem but my question for the audience here today, and we want you to send in some chat, what is your favorite bait for your live trap for raccoons? So you send that in, and then next I'm gonna tell you my surefire way to keep coons out of your corn. But first I want you to send in by chat the favorite bait. Okay, let's see what uh, we can find here. Questions, polls, chat. Uh, okay. Uh, nothing in the chat yet. So what about in the questions? Anyone? Marshmallows. Somebody has put marshmallows. Thanks, Elvin. Uh, sardines. Yes, sardines is one I've used in the past. That, that's my go-to. Uh, or, my dad's favorite was peanut butter. Uh, this was talking about an avian 
this isn't for uh, that, but it's mentioning that uh, near Portage, someone uses a uh, avian control chemical. They get shipped in from BC for specific plots. Uh, it's used in uh, blueberry crops in BC. So maybe that's in research. Yeah, at a research site. Um, okay. So we got the sardines. Oh, here's a new one. Dog food or tuna? I would say soak the dog food in the smelly fish. Uh, shiny objects. Raccoons like shiny objects. They won't let go of it. Okay. okay. I, I have a daughter at home like that too. <laughs> <laughs> no comment whatsoever. Um, okay, so that's what we okay. have in there. So good ideas. Uh, uh, another one that I've heard is uh, jelly beans, mm -hmm. and uh, something that my brother-in-law uses is pepperoni sticks. Uh -huh. So, anyways, some great ideas here. Uh, and the reason I'm not uh, really tuned in on my favorite is because I've got something that works even better for me. I'm going to slip down to my next slide here. I'll just hit this red. Okay, and that is I have found that coons in my area will not cross a headland of oh, wheat or barley. I have oats in here, but wheat and barley I've used. If I run my modern seed drill twice around the outside of the field and plant my corn in the interior i have not had a raccoon come across there uh it, it, if there is sometimes it's because i've done too much tramping in in order to do my uh uh spraying uh i i don't know how uh Common, this works for, for other people, but it, it, it's dynamite for me. I've had some people, some of my friendly neighbors have suggestions. Uh, one is they say that every raccoon has wandered into a quarter section of wheat and took them two weeks to get out. And so they never want to do it again. And one of my other neighbors suggests that raccoons are gluten intolerant. <laughs> Anything is possible. I don't know. Well, we, we know that's a hoax. Ne, 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 nevertheless, I, I would like people to try this out. It, 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 it's, it's worked very well for me. It doesn't keep the deer out, uh, uh, but it has been very successful for me in keeping the uh, raccoons out uh, in, in my area. So, uh, thanks. Uh, Tom, I think we could go back later and get those dates. And maybe maybe we'll circulate something on yeah. that, a bit of a note as to what people found uh, sure. worked best for them. We can certainly do that. Yeah. So, oh, yes. One one other thing. <laughs> sometimes it isn't raccoons you catch. Yes. And so sometimes the catch and release. This this is a friend showing me from a distance. I'm at a distance. How you uh, uh, put a tarp over a skunk when it's in the trap, and how you uh, carefully move it away. Uh, release it uh, to uh, a better place. So, uh, anyways, uh, skunks, that's just part of the game. If you're catching raccoons, you're probably also going to get some skunks. And it's not a good idea to shoot a skunk in the middle of your corn patch <laughs> or it, it can taint your produce. Definitely. Okay, that's all I had on that. Tom, I don't know what your next question is. Well, I, I, I think we could just kind of uh, move maybe right into the idea of uh, some of the physiology, like growth, mm -hmm. harvest marketing kind of thing, if you're okay, if you're interested to, you yeah. know, like... Uh, well, I've got some of the other weird, weird things, the questions yeah. that we often get. Yeah. So the question, Tom, is uh, with sweet corn, it seems we always get tillers. And tillers, that's the like the second or third stalk that tends to come off the plant and they're unsightly and it makes you think that they're uh, almost like a, a pest. Uh, bottom line is to just let them be. Apparently studies that are done, it shows that they're really doing, there's no harm and there's really no benefit to pulling. If you are pulling them off, it's not doing any good and yet it predisposes the plant to uh, fungi like uh, right. uh, common smut so we prefer not it may be an indication that your crop plant stand is too thin 
and you're getting excessive light to the base of the plant. It tends to be a, a hybrid characteristic. And the other thing that may trigger it, they say, is if you've got cold temperatures by early planting. Duh, that's the fact of life in Manitoba. Absolutely. So that's what we do. So I guess we shouldn't be surprised that for our early plantings, we may have a bit more chillering than normal. What Some of the other uh, physiology things uh, that it may be interesting to note here, I, I just refer to it as reproduction in the corn patch. And uh, looking at the crop here. Oh, I can share. Yeah, I don't I understand, mm -hmm. but for, for Kim, I, I got I can it. hear you, Vikram. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, anyways, in, in the corn patch here, the pollen comes from the tassels, and the tassels you'll, you'll see open up and, and start to shed pollen, and the receptor of, is, of course, the silks on the cob. A uh, couple things on this. I kind of figure on timing my sweet corn harvest takes place 23 to 25 days after silking. So when I see silking, I know that if I'm going to get good warm temperatures, it generally it means I'm selling corn in 23 to 25 days. Uh, initially, if you see you're at full pollen shed, uh, if you strip the uh, uh, leaves off your corn cob, you'll find that all those silks are attached to the cob still. They're all attached. They're all effective at, 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 at receiving cob pollen on the end and letting that pollen uh, migrate to a pollen tube to, to fertilize the cob. If you get drought, droughty weather and late weather, and if you get poor pollen shed, here's some, that I think this is just late in the pollen shed, but the only active pollen is on the tip at this point. Uh, we can end up, what this actually what you want to see is that the cob pollinates from the middle to the outside. So this is the first area to pollinate. Uh, where's my little marker again? Uh, pollinates first in the middle and then towards the ends. And so we'll tend to have those silks. They fall off once your corn is pollinated. Uh, if you get a droughty year, like we sometimes have, you'll end up with, fall, with, with all kinds of, of uh, uh, silk still hanging on there. And that means that there wasn't pollen ready at the right time uh, to pollinate there. And that'll mean where you get those blanks in the cob. Uh, nothing you can do about that unless you have uh, irrigation. Uh, but that's one of the things that we put up with in a, in a dry year. And this gives you uh, a chance to check that out to see if that's you're getting normal normal progression or normal pollination. Now, there can be bad reproduction in the corn patch too. Tom, <laughs> that, uh, do you remember this is what we did uh, at your diagnostics school up at Port several years ago, where we actually did. You, you spoke at length last week about the danger of growing different types. For example, it's okay to grow super sweets together. These types can pollinate uh, northern extra super sweet and they're extra early. Uh, th there's a time delay, but they're okay to pollinate. These synergistic types, it's okay for them to pollinate together. And for, for some of these types, it's okay for a bit of cousin pollination, <laughs> I guess. But the bad stuff happens when it pollinates with field corn. And uh, that's when, Tom, you explained the pollen from the field corn so that the, the tassels would uh, fertilize the silks of our sweet corn types. And here is uh, the corn from our, our plots we had that year. And here's the verdict. I, I, I think Natalie, our summer student, I, I cooked up some of this corn and you can see what her verdict is on this stuff. Not so happy. again, uh, so that's why it was so important that you went over last week, the importance of knowing your types and the isolations, uh, or you'll just produce yourself a bunch of unmarketable corn with, uh, if you get a lot of that extra uh, cross-pollination. Um, that, that's all I, uh, well, I'll, I'll just go through this and then I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll leave. Right. Okay, I got a question uh, for you, John. When, when your corn is producing pollen, do you ever see bees in there? Yes, we do. 
and I think you've explained it's not a nectar source, but it's, it's a pollen source. So yeah, corn doesn't have flowers in the sense of flowering plants do, but it does produce pollen, and bees like pollen. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a very attractive um, source of pollen for bees, including honeybees. So mm -hmm. just something to keep in mind if you're ever having to uh, spray for corn borer or corn earworm or something. Um, when the corn is producing pollen, uh, it, it will be attractive to bees. And the bees tend to come in more in the morning than they do later in the day. So um, yeah, so if you are doing spraying and corn is producing pollen, uh, later in the day is better than early day as far as... And which of those products do you recommend uh, greatest for bee safety? Well, Corrigin is harmless to bees, anything in that bee, fam bee order. Um, Corrigin is harmless, Dipal is harmless, um, Intrepid harmless. Um, excess and Entrust, I won't say harmless, um, less harmful than maybe the pyrethroids, they're kind of a middle category. Uh, pyrethroids, if you hit the bees, you will kill them. Um, I remember in the old days when you used to use seven. Oh, yes. yes. That was very bad. You want to tell them what, why the seven was it's bad? It's got enough residual that it'll kill yeah. the bees. And I remember years. hearing that they would take it back to the hive and potentially poison more than the single bee. If they're taking pollen back that is yeah. seven treated, yes. Yeah. It's got that longer residual. So, so if you heard that on the line, if you've got old seven, don't be using it on your corn. <laughs> Not during pollination. It's yeah. Great. Yeah, so good. Thanks, John. The, 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 the other thing uh, uh, I, I just had in here about a rotation I had in here that if you're in gardens or following field crops, that uh, phosphorus availability is a problem if we follow canola, cabbage, cauliflower, beet crops, or fallow. And so uh, uh, that's just a rotation that they do not support some beneficial fungi. And so it's really important that we maintain phosphorus in those situations. And I've got a picture of that, but first I'm starting with, this is what nitrogen deficiency looks like in the corn. The plant will be small and pale colored, but in particular, those bottom leaves will be turning yellow with a V in the bottom. If you catch that early enough, you may still be able to do some supplemental nitrogen, we call that side dressing, but uh, you would prefer not to see this showing up in your corn patch. Phosphorus, we often think as, as, as purpling, but a lot of stresses cause purpling. Usually what we see in the plant, uh, this was from our school, where this is uh, uh, corn rows without the phosphorus close to it versus where we have phosphorus fertilizer placed close to it. We can have a much more vigorous plant early in the season. On our sandy soils, like what I have, sandy soils are notoriously low in potassium. And we can see this type of, of diagnosis or symptom with yellowing of the leaf margins. And it can be variable. In some places that we can run up right up to areas in the field where it's fine. Old manure pile, old burn pile, something in these areas with yellow leaves, that's an indication of pot potassium or potash deficiency. The other micronutrient that I, I mentioned we need to pay attention to in corn is zinc. And that's when we get, again, a seedling plant where we get these white or uh, uh, stripes and whatever near the whorl of the plant. And that can occur uh, in eroded areas. If we see that, the soil test picks that up well. And likewise with sulfur. Sulfur looks similar, only sulfur is striping of the whole leaf of the plant. Uh, th this is a, a healthy plant, and this is one with sulfur deficiency. Again, things that if you're doing a soil testing, you'll be able to, this, these are things that'll pick up for you and alert you in advance. Always best to fix these in advance rather than to try to fix them once the crop is growing. So, uh, Tom, that's that's my right part here as far as the soil and, and physiology comments. Thanks, John. I'm just gonna get back to the 
question and answer here and see if I can find anything new here. Okay. For deer, there's a bird collar company that has a different disc for scaring deers that you'd put in your your deer uh, your electronic deer collar. You'd be oh. a deer scarer versus a collar. Well, I used to find it when uh, Rush Limbo used to be on U.S. <laughs> talk radio. He, he would frighten most things <laughs> on two legs and maybe he'd work on deer too. Oh boy. Um, I, I can't say anything there. But uh, he attracted a lot of two. What was that, Vikram? He distracted and he attracted. Rush <laughs> Limbo. Yes. Um, okay. I think that's about it for in the questions. Um, that's all I can see anyway. Okay, so Vikram, did you want to uh, to go ahead for a few minutes here? Laurie, if you could share Vikram's screen, please. Yeah, I can uh, get into that. So Laurie, help me out here. Yeah, we can see your screen. You have to open up your presentation. <clears throat> Is your presentation open? Okay, so up at the top, there it says display settings. Can you go to that, please? Yep, swap, swap. Perfect. Okay, carry on. Okay, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I had a couple of uh, simultaneously going on a webinar, so I got delayed here, but uh, I think uh, Tom and John and Kim took uh, good care. <clears throat> so I will have a very short presentation here of some of the diseases of concern uh, in sweet corn. <clears throat> we talked about the uh, seedling rots, uh, and we won't talk much about it. Root rots, I'll talk a bit. Yeah. Uh, stock rots, downy mildew is another thing that you will find in your field sometimes. <clears throat> Gosses, wilt, smuts, and rust. There are a few other diseases, but they may be even less important than these. <clears throat> so coming to the stock rots, uh, this is one of the important uh, problems that uh, is happening in areas where we have uh, wheat growing. So this is the common uh, pathogen between the uh, wheat uh, head blight and the fusarium stock rot. Uh, so uh, this will continue to feed into the uh, fusarium head blight in wheat. So uh, something to notice, but by the time we get this problem in our sweet corn, most of it would be harvested and uh, next year, if you change your plot, it probably will not become a big problem. Uh, then there's another uh, stock rot sometimes seen, and that is because of the European corn borer injury, and that could lead to secondary rotting. Uh, and that could be because of uh, anthracnose, it's a fungus, fusarium, and uh, sometimes uh, bacterial infections. So uh, not everything is going to be fusarium, but things as well. And then uh, sometimes you may see in your field some very strange looking uh, cobs or even the tassel. Uh, it will be uh, actually very low percentage, but still it looks really weird. It looks crazy. So the name of the disease is crazy top. It's a down mildew disease. And usually when you have wet fields uh, early in spring or uh, during the say first five, six inches of growth, this fungus can infect uh, the walls and uh, cause the disease. So here is some minor description that uh, in years when you have very uh, heavy rainfall, wet spring, it can be an issue. I don't see this uh, to be a problem for the 2021, 
unless we have uh, lots of rain early spring. So it causes uh, stunting, partial or complete distortion of the plant or the tassel use and the tassels may not develop or uh, there's basically no production on those infected plants. The fungus survives as uh, wool spores in the uh, field, so it will be in the soil for quite some time. So best thing is to have good drainage and rotation. There may be some uh, resistant varieties, but uh, I'm not sure if uh, that is an important disease to, uh, uh, you can say, get extra genetics for resistance. This is uh, an important disease uh, and becoming more important in our province. Uh, the I'll talk in details later about uh, the history, but here is a bacterial disease and it's a gram positive bacteria. Only the leaf blight phase has been seen in Manitoba. Uh, that means we don't see the wilt phase and that would happen if the seedling was infected very early or the seed itself had some infection. And then the infected seed and very early infection could lead to the wilting sometimes, but uh, we don't see it here. Uh, first reported in 2008 in uh, uh, Carmen area, Roland area, and it has been progressing uh, since. It was initially in Manitoba, but now it has been seen in many other provinces. It, so there is some uh, early work uh, done, but in Nebraska, this is a problem. In many US states, this is a problem. So uh, I think it had to come into Canada sometime. So if you have a regular corn grower in your area, or if you see stubbles, coming into your field during the spring melt, it means there's a potential of some of this problem coming into your field. Uh, how do you recognize this disease? Uh, it will have very shiny uh, small dots and this will have water soaked appearance in the uh, early stages, which then join and become a huge uh, leaf, which is uh, basically desiccated. So here is what uh, it looks like, close up. These are wet oozing spots. And when there is, uh, uh, you can say hail or morning dew, this will basically trickle down to the lower leaves. Or if there is uh, rain and thunderstorm, it will move to uh, the nearby neighboring plants. So it can spread very rapidly. So this is uh, another symptom and very good diagnosis will be to break uh, a young looking uh, spot, uh, dip it in a clear glass uh, tumbler and filled with water. And you can see these uh, bacteria, uh, which is just oozing out of the uh, leaf. Uh, so you can tell that it is a bacterial disease and not something else. So there is a fungal disease which looks very similar, but there would be a difference that if you look closely, uh, you will see spores, black spots, whereas here you will see shiny uh, spots, which are the dried out uh, bacteria and the margins are slightly different than here. Anyway, uh, if there's an issue in understanding, it is good to send a photograph or a sample to uh, either Tom, myself, or our uh, lab in Winnipeg. Smut of corn is another uh, disease which uh, looks very ugly. Uh, John has said that, uh, uh, sorry, John Hurd has said that he enjoys eating some of these. Uh, he has Mexican friends uh, who uh, he plays around with uh, getting smuts. So, it is a minor, minor problem uh, in uh, the corn and sweet corn. So uh, probably not to worry about it, but in case it's an issue every year, there's a seed treatment, Vitaflow, that will be effective in killing 
the material or that uh, fungus in the seed. Uh, it can reduce the uh, disease level. Lovely. Then we have some rust, uh, which will come later in the season. It is uh, quite minor and uh, not very economical to spray in most cases. There are some varieties which are very susceptible, uh, like uh, temptation. I'm not sure how many people use that. There is a fungicide uh, possible, but in most uh, cases, by the time this disease would come and become severe, uh, most of the harvesting would be done. So I would say that in general, uh, sweet corn production in Manitoba does not face many uh, diseases. And so you need to be just aware that uh, if there is a uh, funny looking leaf spot or smut, uh, if it is very low percentage, it is not practical. Economically uh, benefit uh, benefiting you to manage it, just remove those plants and probably that's the best solution. In case you are curious, send a photo to Tom or me and uh, you can also send a sample to the diagnostic lab in Winnipeg uh, to get the diagnosis. So that's uh, all that I have here. Since uh, we are not going to be controlling in uh, most cases with pesticides, I did not want to give a long list of uh, uh, registered pesticides for uh, sweet corn disease control, okay? That's great, Vikram. I'm just going to go through the ch uh, questions here, just see if I can find anything. Uh, uh, new the temperature is dropped in corn in the bottom. This is one I must have missed back when John uh, was uh, doing his presentation. Um, Top picture is drought in corn and the bottom picture is ideal conditions. I'm not sure which one they were looking at. That question's in relation to, John. Top picture is drought. Bottom picture is... Oh, maybe it's the tasseled. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Where is that one? Uh, in the silk. The drying of the tassel? Yeah. Uh, yeah, just where the silks are attached to the cob. Uh, uh, yeah, no, we're into sex in the corn patch there. Uh, uh, yeah, no, th those are taken at two different times. The top picture was taken uh, uh, on a variety that had not yet pollinated. The bottom picture is one that pollination was almost complete. The only kernels left to be pollinated are some on the tip. But if at that stage we had husked it and found a whole bunch of silks still attached elsewhere along the cob, that would be telling us that pollination was poor and it is often drought and high heat conditions that cause that pollination to be poor. So uh, yeah, this is just a, a, a comparison of uh, uh, timing of the stage of the plant before pollination and then almost finished pollination on the bottom. All right. Thanks, John. Um, okay, so I think we're going to. We had a question uh, come in over the the week about uh, grass control in uh, in sweet corn, and I think Kim's going to. Give us a little bit of a discuss, lead a little bit of a discussion on that, and I'll just bring her presentation up here. And we're still unmuted. There we go. We're good to go, Kim. So basically, the question that Kim's going to deal with a bit is one that was asked about uh, just uh, grass control and. Uh, that in in sweet corn and here's Kim. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks, Tom, for having me. Um, I just thought I would just do a little bit of weed ID and just on the grasses. We could spend a lot of time on weed ID, but I will just do some grasses today. 
Um, so weed characteristics for ID, ideally when we're looking, we want to know what it is when it's really little. Um, and there's cotyledons, not on grass weeds, but in general on broadleaf weeds, there's cotyledons, which are kind of not true leaves yet. Um, and they're very distinctive shaped. And then once the plant gets a little bit bigger, um, then we get what we call true leaves. There's also vegetative structures like roots and things like that, sometimes stolons, which are above ground um, and roots that obviously are below ground. And then later on, um, when we get to the reproductive part on plants, there's like the inflorescence and the flowers and finally the seed. And by that point, it's way too late for um, controlling them. But sometimes we um, aren't very good at identifying weeds until we see them when they're fully grown and we can start to see them. If you have to key out a weed, um, usually then we, and we're not sure what it is, we do have to wait sometimes till there's actually flowers on them and sometimes all the way to seeds because um, we use those characteristics when we're not sure what a weed is. But normally for weed control, we need to control these things way before that. So um, if they're gotten big, then really they've, they've already done damage to the crop. Um, they've taken uh, nutrients, they've taken precious moisture in the dry years. And, um, and then also too, if we let them set seed, then they're, we're adding to the weed seed bank for uh, the next uh, number of years. Um, there's an old gardening saying, I think one year seeding is seven years weeding. And um, sometimes it's more than that. Some of these weed seeds can last a very long time. But anyway, so um, when we're looking at grass weeds, um, identifying features, there's basically the leaf and the sheath, which is like the, it kind of goes around the, the leaf, leaf part that wraps around the stem, the roots, the oracles and the ligules. So these are maybe some terms that maybe some of you haven't heard, but these are how we identify grasses. If we have a grass that has three leaves on it, we should be able to identify what it is because there's not hardly anything to look at and it's just kind of a combination of these things. So when a, when a weed here gets really big, when a grass gets really big, we see the seed head, there's leaves here. This is the leaf part here. Um, sometimes this mid rib on the leaf, like on a corn plant, the mid rib is very big and very thick. Um, on most, on some grasses it's distinct and maybe a dis different color or uh, whether it's thicker or not. Um, there's nodes, yeah, those are the bumps on the stem. And then uh, here, when we're looking at what we call the collar, the collar is usually this little back part of the leaf. And same as when we're um, staging corn and counting collars in, in corn leaves, it's the back part of the leaf. And sometimes it's a very distinctive shape. It could be a different color, it could be dark, it could be white, it could be kind of bow tie shaped. On some types of grasses, it's kind of on an angle. Where, and, and so it's very distinctive. Um, tiller, this will be where like another stem comes out. Usually that'll come out at the base of the leaf, it, usually near the base of the plant, but it'll come out of one of the old leaves. So we'll get um, with our grasses, we'll get a few leaves going and then we start getting what initially looks like another leaf coming, but it's probably a tiller, which means it's another stem. So um, the ligules are kind of in this area here and they're kind of, if you pull the leaf back and you take a look at it where it attaches right onto the stem, we call this the ligule. And it could be membranous, which is kind of like almost rubbery feeling or looking. Um, and something like a wild oat or even a tame oat's got a very distinctive membranous um, ligule. Sometimes it's hairy and it's either a fringe of hairs or it could be long skinny hairs. Um, and we'll see some of these weeds up close in a minute. Um, and sometimes it's not there at all. So basically what type of ligule it has and what that ligule looks like will really help us identify that grass leaf. You just have to have a leaf big enough to pull back and to see this area. So they can be tiny and you can be identifying what the heck it is. Now, oracles, I always think these are like little arms that wrap around the base of the leaf and they look like, sometimes they wrap, they're big and they look like they're almost hugging the stem. That's something like a, like a, a barley. If we ever take a look at barley, it's got very distinctive oracles and sometimes they're not present at all, but even then sometimes they're a different color. Um, and they're just a different shape and basically more or less whether they're there and the size of them. So, and here, um, the sheath is where how the leaf attaches on the stem. Sometimes we have it quite um, open like this. Sometimes we have it overlapping like this one here in the middle. And sometimes we have it fused and, and different grasses, more so different grass families um, have a different sheath characteristics in here. I don't use that one quite so much, but um, if you, it, it is a very good characteristic if you have to use it. Um, so, and here on ligules, um, this is again, this is a, a, an oat or possibly a wild oat. It's very hard to tell right now from this. We wouldn't be able to tell on this picture, but I do know this is probably an oat. This is very um, clear and almost rubbery looking. It's very thick um, and it, it's sticking up. It's like, I always think it sticks up really, really high. 
And so again, um, here, this would, these uh, black and white pictures down here, this is a membranous ligule. This one is just a tiny little fringe of hairs. Um, this one is, they call it truncate. This one, there's nothing there at all. Um, this one is membranous and it's kind of rounded. Sometimes they point up into a little pointy bit and um, they're, that one's called tapered. And sometimes they're very toothed. They're very rough looking on top. But usually something like this, a, an oat or a wild oat is a very tall one and it's kind of messy at the very top end of it. Um, oracles in here, um, again, these are these little structures right here. They're right here. This is a big one. Um, I'm not sure what this is actually, but there's these are big oracles in here, and this actually there's no oracles here whatsoever. So here we have what we call claw-like, um, and these can be bigger. These ones are a bit rounded in here. These ones there's not really much. There's just little bumps, and here this leaf on the this fourth one, this leaf is very smooth. There's no oracles whatsoever. So and again here we've got three different plants, and these are actually not weeds at all. Well, they could be weeds. Um, they could be weeds if they're volunteer plants in your sweet corn. So this one is barley. It's got big, big oracles, and they kind of look like they could almost wrap right around onto the back part of the stem. This is wheat. They're small, and I find um, when I'm in fields and I'm looking at different wheat varieties, sometimes these are quite different colors. Depending on the variety, they can be quite red or quite brown looking. And then this is an oat. It has doesn't have any oracles at all, but you can already see that ligule is really big and kind of rubbery, very membranous in behind. So so anyways, and then when we're looking at grass weed identification, honestly, the first thing to do is pick, pull it up. Just pull it up and take a look at it. Sometimes you can see really interesting things like this seed that's still attached to it. <laughs> so that's usually a dead giveaway. Um, it's very easy to, um, lots of times too, that's the first thing, is if you can pull it up, take a look at it. If you pull it up and there's long rhizomes underneath, that's probably a quack grass. It could be something else, but I would put my money on quack grass. That'd be my first thing. But this one, you can see the volunteer plants. You can really see a wild oat plant because um, the wild oat is very distinctive looking seed um, and it stays attached for a very long time. Um, and so anyways, one of the first things I do, if you can at all pull it up, and sometimes we break them off if we pull them up, so it's nice to have a little trowel with you um, or some type of a little digging stick. Um, there's some nice little tools you can get for judging seeding depth, and um, which would be important for corn to get the, the seeding depth right. And they're quite sturdy little metal tools, and um, they're very good for digging up stuff like this, but if worse comes to worse, I... Uh, I will. Uh, I have a little trowel that I keep on a clip on my belt loop, and um, and I usually have that. Plus, I have a little digging stick that has um, a little measuring tape on it. Like I think it goes. I think it's four inches, and that way it helps me with depth and trying to determine seeding depth, and also when I'm looking for fertilizer bands and things like that. Um, again, so this is just to quickly go through some grass weed identification. Now here we can see there's a bit of an oracle back here already. We haven't pulled this leaf back, but we can also see too, there's some little hairs, not a lot of hairs in here. Um, but also when I pull this up and I take a look and it's got this long skinny uh, root and there's, um, there's like a, a wild oat seed right there. So this is wild oat. There's no oracle. Um, there's no specialized stems. Um, and um, but it does have this big ligule right there. Um, this one, when we look at it, it's very flat looking. Sometimes they're really red down in here, really purpley or really red colored. You can't always go by color um, because that could be a, a, a stress. It could be uh, it could also be fertilization, whether they're darker or whether they're lighter green. Um, but usually when we see there's a few weeds in here that are very flat. First of all, this is very flat. If you squish this between your thumb and your finger, it's very flat feeling. So that would kind of tell me it's one of a couple of different weeds right off the hop. And a, either a barnyard grass or our millets are all quite a bit like this. They have a very flat stem and they do tend to be very red looking um, in here, especially towards the very base of the plant. But again, you can't always go by color. Um, you can't say, oh, it's purple. It's gotta be barnyard grass. It's flat. So I would say right off the hop, it's either one of the millets um, or foxtails, I guess. Um, is another name for them, or it would be barnyard grass. And then what I would be looking for in here, barnyard grass has a big, thick bow tie shaped collar in here. And there also is no ligule at all. It's very bare. And when you pull this leaf back, it's very shiny inside. Um, and it's a, a dead giveaway. If it has nothing, if it has no oracles, no ligules, and the, the collar back here is kind of bow tie shaped, like it's kind of fatter here and skinny right along the, the mid vein, um, that would tell me that's barnyard grass. And you can tell that again, you need to have about three leaves to be able to get a leaf big enough to pull it back. 
And when we're looking at the foxtails, basically they will have this ligule in here with this, it'll be a fringe of hairs. And then depending whether it's uh, yellow foxtail or green foxtail, we'll have yellow foxtail will have these long, long, long skinny hairs. Um, and and it's, not, it's not super, super hairy, but they are like they, it, the green, yellow foxtail in here will still have this fringe of hairs, but it has these long, long skinny little hairs going further up the leaf. It, it, that's kind of a dead giveaway. When, if you do see them side by side, yellow foxtail will be bigger. Usually it's, a, it's just a bigger seed head, but you, that's hard to tell unless you have them side by side. But you really, if you see this fringe of hairs, that would tell me that's a foxtail. And these, uh, I think they call them ciliate hairs because they're long and, and very, very uh, delicate um, hairs. That would tell me that's yellow foxtail. So again, they both have this, this ligule in here. A yellow foxtail has this. And again, that's just a way to tell them apart. And foxtails versus barnyard grass. Again, your barnyard grass, is good. they're both gonna be flat. They're both gonna have um, that, uh, they may have this red bit or purpley bit down here on the stem, but it's gonna be that fringe of hairs um, on, and possibly the hairs going up the stem if it's a yellow foxtail. Barnyard grass just won't have anything at all. And then sometimes we have these specialized stems. So we have rhizomes that go below ground. That would be something like a quack grass. And then there's some grasses too that have a stole on that actually goes above ground. Um, and it connects the plants that way. But if you pull up a plant and you've got a rhizome, it's probably a quack grass. Quack grass can actually look a fair bit like wheat, um, but it, it's one of our only grasses here that has rhizomes. There's grasses elsewhere that, that have rhizomes, but quack grasses are a bad one. So again, you would pull this up and then you see this rhizome. You can see there's more roots coming here. All these are this little white thing right here. But as it grows along and everywhere, there's a bump with kind of almost looks like hairs on it. Um, you will actually see all of these places where there's a node along these stems is a place that a new plant can come up. So there's a new plant coming from here, but we have the potential for it to send up lots and lots of plants. So if you break this rhizome up through tillage, you'll have to watch because there will be, that's, you're basically just cutting this open and it's kind of like portulaca. Um, it'll just grow more plants if it's still sitting there. So um, it's something just to watch for when you're doing tillage um, we can, in, it, it, you know, you have to do the tillage, you, you have to break up the roots and you either bury them deep or you can bring them right up to the surface and stuff and they'll kind of dry out. But anytime you do break this root, um, it's going to send a signal to send more shoots up and uh, you can get more plants that way. And that's how our quack grass patches can get very big, very, very, very quickly. And again, in here, this is quite, I think it looks quite a bit like wheat. It's got a little bit of an oracle, not much. Um, and the seed head, um, looks more like a wheat grass or something like that. But again, if we let it get this far, it's really not, that's way too late, but it does kind of has a skinny little seed head. And uh, yeah, so it's got, it's a spike head is what they call it. And, but definitely the rhizomes. So in here, this is my last one. This is foxtail barley. And uh, we do, this is very, very soft. And it sometimes has a real bluish tint to it. And it's because of the hairs on it. It's very, very hairy, but they're very soft mm -hmm. and they're very, very fine hairs. And I find when I when I touch this plant, if I grab it near the base and pull up on it, it just feels very soft, almost silky. And it's a bunch grass. So it'll grow in a bunch like this. And if you pull this up, this will be maybe just one big plant, but it's a bunch grass. So you'll see these clumps all through your field. Um, this tends not to survive with tillage. So probably you're not going to see this if you're doing any kind of tillage in and around your corn, but you may find you may find it on the edge. Um, or you may find it in fields that you know haven't had corn in them or you're planning on putting corn into, um, but it does tend to not survive well in tillage. So I wouldn't worry about it too terribly much, but um, you should be able to get a handle on that. But when you do see that, and again, it's very soft, very hairy, um, and in these clumps and stuff. And these are the, the seed heads, they'll get stuck in your socks and, and that type of thing. They, they've got backward pointing barbs on them and uh, they get stuck in things and that's how they get moved around. So uh, this is just, this basically is most of the grasses that we would ever have to deal with. Again, your wheat, your barley, your oats, those would be weeds if they're volunteer in your, in your, um, in your, in your sweet corn crop. And then this table would just tell you whether the sheath, these are all split. Um, then the ligule here is membranous, oracles are small and hairs, life cycle annual. So this is just a good table to compare them. Uh, if you know what you're looking at, you can kind of just basically eliminate. Like if you had 
Um, quack grass and the sheath is, if you had a grass and the sheath is overlapping, there's a bit of a ligule. It has oracles. Um, at this point, it could be this. Um, it, 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 but um, the minute you pull it up and you see the rhizomes, you know for sure that's wild, that's, that's a quack grass. And so you basically, by process of elimination, because you really only have um, a couple of different things to look at. I mostly just look at the ligule and the oracles, but when you look at the sheath too, you've only got three things to look at and you can figure out pretty quick what your grass weeds are. So I think that was about all I had, Tom, if you okay. I'll just, wanted to. I'll just check the questions here and then we'll finish up. Okay. And maybe next year where we could do a, a broadleaf weed identification, you know, we could yeah. do something like that. Yeah. Sure. But you're, you're scaring me. <laughs> All those only two or three of them are ever going to show up yeah. in my corn patch. Probably our, our, our foxtails are yeah. like, and they can take down a corn crop. Your corn mm -hmm. is so not competitive, and your foxtails um, can be just a, an absolute carpet. They also are a warm season weed, like our corn is. It's a C4 mm -hmm. plant, which is a warm season weed, and they um, so they love whatever weather makes corn grow also makes your foxtails grow or your millets we call them my dad always called it wild millet um and and so that's the thing you uh yeah th those are probably your worst ones maybe some wild oats in places but if you've got any kind of tillage hopefully your quack grass is not going to be there your foxtail barley shouldn't be there and your volunteer cereals maybe depending what was in the cr in the right. field the year before but yeah. there shouldn't be if you had a good combine there shouldn't be enough of that left behind right to cause a problem i would hope Okay, I just looked through the chat and I couldn't see any uh, additional questions. Thanks, Kim. So I, I, I think just to, to end here, I know we're getting close here and uh, I'll just keep going. Okay, so economics wise, I, I, I think it's in, important to, to think about what, what's gonna influence the, the, the price that it's in the marketplace. I mean, it's not like, uh, fuel when you go to the gas station and there's a tornado and or a hurricane in Texas and the price goes up. Like it's it's not that uh, way for corn. So what influences it? Well, how much corn is in the marketplace? Are you the first one in early season? If then, if, if that's the case, you can uh, thank your lucky stars. You're probably uh, gonna be able to uh, set the price. Um, organic. Um, is your corn organic? Does the area you're selling in command a premium for that? Um, conversely, what, what if you got uh, worm issues? Say uh, you ignored John's advice and you, you had some worms and uh, it was a uh, very high level and you might have to be thinking about how am I gonna get rid of my corn in the sense of uh, discount maybe. Well, they sell for a $2 discount at our farmer's market. Okay um the the other thing about when you're deciding on uh what influences the price obviously is are you selling retail or wholesale i, I mean that's huge the if, if you're selling in a retail like in a roadside stand or uh something out of the back of a truck at the end of the lane whatever it is like that's different than if you're selling to uh someone who is then selling it so retail versus wholesale, uh, where are we here? Now, basically you gotta be competitive is the bottom line. It's one thing to have the, the best corn or the worst corn and you go, well, I'll get rid of it if it's the worst by selling it cheaper or if it's, if it's the best I can charge more. And, and that's, that's true in a way, but you just, you gotta be competitive, I, I think is the, the biggest thing to remember here. Um, so I don't know, John might have a comment on this, but in talking to uh, folks around sort of a $7, six, $6.50 somewhere, I, I don't know, comments, John, thoughts, concerns? Everybody should sell their corn at the same price. We should be a monopoly. Keep your price at, let's raise it to seven fifty this year. I, I sell corn for what the price of wheat is. Yeah. And wheat will be seven <laughs> seven fifty a bushel. So that's what corn should be. Uh, but don't get in a bidding war yeah. with your neighbor that has substandard corn. No. Uh, nobody makes money if you start underselling your neighbor in price. Yeah. 
you'll just tick them off and uh, you want to be friends with your competitors. You don't want to uh, both be giving your corn away because you're trying to take his market away. For sure. Her market away. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, I agree 100% with John. That'll show up probably in just a little bit here, but uh, it, it influences to the, the price. I touched on it a bit. Let's say you uh, followed some of John uh, Hurd's advice. You got a sandier spot. You uh, got it going early and uh, you're first one in the market. Well, you if you're the first one there, you're lucky enough to set the price. Everybody who's looking for fresh corn has got to come to you. So there's the potential for a higher price than it will be the following week or 10 days or however many days later when there's more people in there. And here's to John's point. Underlined in red and bolded, John, just for you, never undervalue your crop. That's Tom's cardinal rule. So basically, uh, we touched on it earlier, but uh, you know, when we're thinking economics, some people go as low as 800. I've heard in S doing uh, doing a balance sheet, trying to figure out uh, profit loss before it actually happens, kind of thing. You know, um, some people are as high as 1,200, so a thousand's a decent uh, decent number. You know, somewhere in the the seven thousand gross an acre when you're you're thinking of economics. Um, we talked about this part here, where you know, what are we doing? We're marketing it direct to consumer. I I mentioned roadside stands, backs of trucks. Well, it could be farmers market. John mentioned that's where uh, where they're selling theirs. CSAs, community supported agriculture. Uh, then no longer direct to consumer but could go wholesale or uh to resellers basically and those resellers are usually stores but there could be someone looking to buy corn to put it in the back of their truck to go down the road and sell it but uh that's not as common um okay i, I don't want to spend a lot of time here but cost the biggest thing to remember here is cost of production when you go to work it out in sweet corn, it's extremely variable because the types of operations are so variable. Small size operation with minimum amount of equipment versus say a large, you know, a couple of hundred acres with uh, lots of mechanized equipment. Um, that, that's gonna, gonna create wild swings in uh, the costs that are gonna go into COPs. So, you know, organic versus conventional as well as another thing, but I'm not trying to cop out on it, but COP is very hard to uh, to do. So th these are, are not any secrets here. There are fixed costs and operating costs. And, and I mean, I, I happen to take them out of, a, out of a corn, it was a field corn COP, but still I modified them a little bit, but I, I'm not gonna read them all because you know they're they're going to be they're going to be variable depending on uh, on your operation. But here, Tom's second cardinal rule of growing sweet corn: if you're a smaller operation and you uh, you don't have uh, say any paid employees or whatever, whether it's your own family or just yourself or whatever the case may be, you got to count for your own labor. You you can't work for free. Always pay yourself. That's the only other thing in my whole presentation that's underlined it and bolded in red. So if nothing, you know, if you take away nothing else, pay yourself and never undervalue your crop. Um, factors affecting it. And there we go again. Okay. So that is where I wanted to end. I kind of blew through the COP part, but like I say, it's variable for everybody. So I'm not, I think the big thing you should do is work on it yourself. And if you got questions, then look for uh, look for a source to get some answers. Um, okay, I'm just gonna look and see quickly if there's any questions in the chat or in the question and answer. I don't see any. Lori, can you see if I'm missing any? I don't see any. No, there was one from Vikram that uh, asked about, can you sell frozen sweet corn cut off and frozen in bags? I'm not sure if you had uh, asked that one. Okay, so uh, that gets into the processing part 
of vegetables. Um, you, you would need to, to do that operation in a uh, licensed uh, facility, commercial kitchen. A uh, fair number of churches in smaller towns have licensed commercial kitchen, kitchens that you could lease or rent uh, space in, but you couldn't, if you're gonna do it legally, you couldn't do it on your, uh, in, in your own kitchen at home or in the back of your truck or wherever. So it could be done. It would just require a little bit of uh, planning, I guess. Okay, well, went a little longer than I thought. My apologies. Um, it, basically, I'll give one last uh, chance. Anyone on the uh, webinar, if you got a question, just type it in the chat there. Or sorry, in the question and answer, not the chat. My bad. And. Uh, well, uh, just before I check it for the last time, I just want to uh, thank everybody for uh, attending and of course the presenters for their time. Uh, come back next week, uh, we'll talk, uh, or sorry, the webinar will be on passive solar greenhouses. Uh, Sajad Rao from ACC will be putting uh, that one on. And if when you registered, uh, you submitted your CCA number, if you are a member, you will uh, get, uh, uh, what's the right word here? We will submit your number on your behalf to get credits. Now, any other questions? I don't see any. So I'm gonna say thank you everyone and uh, hope to see you or hear from you uh, this week with any questions you have and we'll hopefully see you next week. Thank you very much. Bye.